Recording in progress. Recording. Okay, good to see everyone here. So we're live streaming on Facebook here right now. I'm also going to get Instagram set up really quick um, so we can go live on Insta as well. Um, but I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. We've got some good material to cover. All right, here we go. Get Instagram set up. So we've got some good material to cover. I'm going to be talking today about the sacred account um, and what companies to set up an account with, right? There's more than one company that does this, uh, that we work with as insurance carriers. There's not a ton of them, right? So we're going to go over the handful of ones that do work. And we're going to talk about why those are the ones we use, um, you know, versus other companies that could be out there, right? So um, let me get Instagram up and running and we're going to get this thing started. All right, who do we have so far? We've got, I see Andrew, Crystal, Dave, Ian, James, Jason. Awesome, I see a bunch of you guys on here. So before we get up and running, as I'm typing this, I'm just kind of multitasking as I set up Instagram. Um, I wanna go over a couple of the things we cover each week. So the first one is I wanna make sure that you have a reason for being here today, right? So if you've um, tuned in and this is your first time, you're a repeat client, you're you know maybe following me for a little bit, or maybe you've never seen me before, Right. Um, you know, this is something that that uh, I like to cover every week. And that really is, you know, having a purpose for being here. What are you trying to learn? And so we're going through, you know, sacred account Saturday each week covering different aspects of the sacred account. This is basically the ability to be your own bank. And so with that, you know, if I'm going to a bank, I'm usually, you know, paying off debt or I'm saving or I'm investing. And so if you think about it as your own bank, I want you to think about what are your goals right now? Right. Are you in the mode where, you know, you're saving money and, um, you know, you're trying to find a better way or maybe increase your savings or paying off debt, you know, and that's what this is going to be used for. Or maybe, you know, you're looking to make a large purchase and you want to use your, the sacred account for that, or it could be investing. Right. So I want you to have that top of mind. Um, and then the other thing, too, is I want you to get rid of the uh, idea that money is complex. Right, let me just finish setting up Instagram as I'm multitasking. Okay, awesome. We're going to go live on Instagram. We're just piloting this out for the first week. So let me put Instagram on live and that should do it. So um, as you're going through this, I want you to think about what your goals are. Right. What are you trying to get out of this? Why are you why are you tuning in? What are you setting your account up for? And then part of that is also going to be, you know, getting rid of the idea, like I said, that money is this complicated thing because it's really not right. Finances are simple. And so if you've got the idea that they're complicated, you know, probably you got that from Wall Street. Um, and that's something that was programmed into all of us through just propaganda and marketing. Right. Propaganda and marketing and propaganda and marketing means that they're trying to sell us products and services. Right. That's the goal of Wall Street and banks. And so rather than solving our needs with those products and services, they instead convince us that money's hard. We can't understand it and we need them. Right. That's that's a classic kind of uh, slave master relationship. And so if you look at it, we are in financial slavery. If we have consumer debt and we've got to pay the bank every month, that's a degree of financial freedom we've lost to the banking system. Right. If we are um, putting money in an account that we can't touch till we're 60, that is a degree of financial slavery. We've lost freedom to Wall Street. Right. If, if every time we earn high income, we're worried about, oh, I'm going to pay more in taxes and have less left to that degree. We've lost freedom to the IRS. Right. So these groups, they've convinced us that finances are hard. It's complicated. It can't be understood. It's something that you should just leave to the trained professionals and those with all of the pedigrees. And it couldn't be further than the truth. Right. Like that's that's not how it works. And that's not like finances are not this this complicated, hard to understand thing. Right. So that's the first point I want to make that I always like to cover each week. The second point I want to make is that um, I want you to get rid of the idea that, you know, it all often the things that are the most important for us to learn are the things that, you know, we need to hear more than once. And so, you know, there, there will be repetition. Like we cover a lot of the same stuff every week, not because you didn't hear it before, but because that's how you learn drilling something over and over and over until you've got it down, right? And, and knowledge, if you guys are just tuning in on Instagram, it's good to see you guys as well. Knowledge is represented by competence, results, right? So if I have results, 
then I have knowledge. If I don't have results to that degree, I lack knowledge. Okay. And so the point of this course today is to make sure you've got knowledge on finance. So we're streaming live on Facebook. We're streaming live on Instagram. Now we've got Zoom. This will be up on the replay. Whether, regardless of where or why, how you're watching, you want those three points to be in purpose this year. You know, you understand that money is not impossible to learn about. You're not going to learn anything today if you think you can't learn. Uh, and then also, if you don't think you need to learn, I know it all already, right? So if you're already financially independent, you're already passive income exceeds your savings, expenses, and taxes, you're right. You don't need to be here today, right? But if you're like most of us where you're like, I'm not there yet, then look at what can I get out of this to improve my life financially? Guys, I've been doing these courses every single year for the last five years, I think now, uh, every week, over and over and over, covering this as free education so that the word gets out. Right. So that's the goal of the course. Now, a couple of things I like to go over each week. Um, so the first thing is, is if you are not yet a client, OK, I want to get you set up with a free copy of my book. I'm going to pull up the picture of it here. Uh, this is called Blueprint to Financial Freedom. And this is basically going to give you what you need to know in order to start building wealth, in order to start improving your finances. OK, we're not going to cover everything on the webinar today. And so I want to show you the book. You can grab a copy of this um, throughout the, the, the webinar today. I will be reminding you that this is available. But if you go to jerryfeta.com forward slash B2F promo, you can grab a free copy of the book here. Okay. I wrote this book a number of years back to create, you know, some organization in how finances are done. A lot of people, they'll, they'll watch a webinar like this. They'll watch a live stream. They'll tune into their favorite guru, whatever it might be. And they'll learn one concept. And they'd be like, that's really exciting and interesting. Let me do that. And then that's how they do the rest of their finances as well. Then they hear another concept and they're like, oh, let me add that. And then they hear another one and they're like, let me add that. And before you know it, you have confusion. You have a bunch of random concepts that weren't coordinated together, that are not organized. And it just creates confusion and it gets messy and it makes your finances feel stuck. And so the wealthy work in sequences. If you study the top 1% the way that I have, one of the first things you notice is that their system is very duplicatable. Like from generation to generation, there's not a lot of variance in what they do to build wealth. And that's one of the reasons why we have a historical top 1%. It's a game plan. It's a blueprint, just like a house. Blueprints of financial freedom. You wouldn't build a house at random. You would do a blueprint first and then follow that in sequence and use the right tools to work on the right projects with the right people at the right time and in the right sequence, right? Finances are the same way. Okay, so the book here, if you're not yet a client, you don't have a copy of the book. If you guys are on Instagram here, uh, I'll zoom you in. You can go to jerryfeta.com forward slash B2F promo uh, and get a copy of that. Okay, now let me flip you guys around for a bit so you can see my face as well. What's up, Instagram? Good to see you guys. Um, so that's one of the first things I want to cover today. The second thing is I do want to set you up with a free consultation with my team. So this is whether you're a client or not. If you're not a client, same thing. If you're a client, same thing, okay? Um, on, my, on the webinar today, we've got Brianna Shaw and Julia Allender. They're both endorsed wealth mentors for my company. Uh, and so what that means is they work one-on-one -on -one with clients. Um, they help people, you know, with a strategy call. They help people with, you know, putting together their, their blueprint, helping them take their next steps, educating them on concepts, giving them, you know, accountability, support, et cetera. This is one of the things that's missing. Okay, did you guys realize that two-thirds of Americans don't have one-on-one -on -one financial guidance? Okay, two-thirds of Americans. Okay, the correlation between Americans that do not have financial advice on a one-on-one -on -one basis and Americans that don't have money saved for emergencies and don't have money saved for retirement is 100%. Meaning 66% of Americans do not have one-on-one -on -one financial advice. 66% of Americans do not have an emergency fund, and 60% of Americans believe their retirement is not on track. They don't think they're going to retire, right? So there's a, a correlation between having someone that you can rely on, having someone that helps you with your finances, and actually achieving financial success, right? So that's why we have our endorsed wealth mentors. You will never pay them for their time. Uh, they're here to help you. They're here, here to reach out to you to do a consultation, a strategy call, and get you that one-on-one -on -one relationship, because if you reverse the correlation, that means 33% of Americans do have someone they can rely on. They do have one-on-one -on -one guidance, right? One third of Americans have one-on-one -on -one guidance. A third of Americans have money saved up for reserves and emergencies. And a third of Americans have their retirements on track, right? I see a correlation there. And that's, that's what our endorsed wealth mentors are all about. So I'm gonna talk more about this today during our webinar. Let me just flip Instagram back around here. Um, 
So what I'm going to be going over today is how do you become your own bank and what companies do you set this up with, right? And, and to lead that off, we have to understand what is our own bank and why would we want to become that, right? Um, and so as we're going through this, um, you know, we'll cover the, the topics. Jules and Bree are going to be reaching out to you in the chat. Again, if you, if you see a message from them, check your messages uh, and Jules and Bree can let me know if they've not heard from you. I can, I can definitely let you know as well to set up a call. But my goal is for everyone on this phone call today to set up a call with Bree and Jules. Okay, everyone that's live on Zoom today, I would like you to schedule with Bree and Jules. And you can do that by answering their message in the chat. Just give them your phone number and say, hey, I want to do a call this week. If you're not yet a client, this is going to be a free strategy call. Okay, our intention is to help you. Our intention is to earn your business, but that's free. If we can't help you, you don't need to work with us, right? You'll find that on a call. Can, can we help you accelerate your financial progress? If you are a client, we want you to keep making progress. Do a check-in call with them, okay? Every single person that's a client should have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with an endorsed wealth mentor, right? And so that means that you want to connect with them and say, hey, I want to do a free call. Let's check in. Let's see where I'm at, right? And so, you know, these are all things that I want you to do, all right? Now, before we uh, move any further here, let me just share my screen. We're going to be talking about the sacred accounts, okay? That is our topic of choice, not just today, but every week. Right. So what is the sacred account? The sacred account is high early cash value dividend paying whole life insurance. Right. High early cash value dividend paying whole life insurance. Now, before we dive into what this is and how it works, I want to give you a little bit of information about my company uh, and what we do. So my company is called Wealth Dynamics, uh, and we've got two main visions that I want to share with you. So the first one is to help millions of families, individuals and entrepreneurs financially fund a life of abundance and prosperity in all dynamics. Okay, that's what wealth means, abundance and prosperity in all dynamics. It's not just money, right? If I have money, but I'm overweight, I'm not healthy, like I'm not wealthy yet. If I, if I have money, but I have a bad relationship with my spouse, I'm not wealthy. If, I'm, if I have money and, I, and I'm doing poorly professionally, I'm not wealthy. Abundance and prosperity in all dynamics of life, right? Now, that also means on the flip side, if I'm doing well with my spouse, my job, you know, I'm in good physical shape and I don't have money, I'm also not wealthy. It does take both, right? And so our goal is to help millions of people get there. The other goal that we have is to build the largest financial services company in U.S. history, right? Let me move my cat off of the, uh, go on this one. Uh, to build the largest financial services company in U.S. history. So we're looking to build over 250,000 licensed agents and ambassadors across the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico. So if you're watching today, two of my goals is to fit you into one, two, or both of these categories, okay? If you have a, a, a pulse and you've got, you know, blood throwing, through, through, flowing through your brains and you earn, or through your body, not your brains, through your veins, and you earn an income, I want to help you with number one. I want to help you become financially uh, independent, achieve greater financial freedom, and, and fund that life of abundance and prosperity in all dynamics, right? If you're entrepreneurial and you're looking to help people, I want to help you become a licensed agent with us today, right? Now, there's four main things that we help with. The first one is financial education. Right now, 53% of U.S. adults experience financial anxiety. Uh, financial solvency, two and three U.S. families uh, lack an emergency funds. And then financial freedom, 60% of non-retirees don't think their investments are on track right now. So there's something going on with the statistics, and we share the truth about money with those around us. We talked about this at the very beginning. Only 33.4% of Americans have professional financial guidance, which means two-thirds of Americans don't, which is also two-thirds of Americans that don't have an emergency fund and two-thirds of Americans that aren't on track for retirement. There's a correlation there, and that's part of what we do is we provide that one-on-one -on -one help for people. Now, in life, there's going to be two lifestyles, and as you're watching this, you kind of need to determine, as you're watching this, you kind of need to determine which one is you, right? Deferral lifestyle or financial independence, right? And deferral lifestyle means that, you know, I trade my time for money, spending 40 hours a week serving the 40 year to life sentence, uh, hoping that one day I can die and retire with money, right? And, 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 I, and I have all the money there, but I die before it runs out. Okay, and that's kind of the traditional American retirement thing. If you think about it, right? I'm going to work 40 to 60 hours a week, 40 years to life sentence. I'm trading time for money. Hopefully I can retire one day and I die before the money runs out. Number two is financial independence, which is passive income. Okay, passive income from investments that exceed savings, expenses, and taxes. So we can live life now and not be obligated to trade time for money. 
And that's what we help people do. And as you're watching this today, you've got to decide which matters for you. Okay, do I want to defer the rest of my life? And this is part of my story, guys. I became a financial advisor at the age of 18. My first client was my mom, right? And she did the traditional retirement thing because that's what I was trained for. I was trained, you know, you set up a retirement plan for someone. And then when they turn 60, they can start living off of that. Well, at age 60, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer, right? And within six months, she had passed away. And so this deferral thing didn't work. And I watched it unravel with my own mother, okay? The financial independence part of this, it does take more work in the next five to 10 years. You will work harder the next five, 10, maybe 15 years. But after that, you've got financial independence. You don't need to do the, def def the deferral thing, okay? Because you have financial independence. You have to decide, am I, do I want to live life now or do I want to live life later? And if I live it later, is it still going to be around the way that I was planning for it? Okay, and there is a third option. The third option is denial, right? Like I'm going to pick neither of these and I'm just going to pretend none of this matters. One day you will be old and you will be like, I wish I didn't have to work this job anymore. You need to plan ahead, right? And if you're planning, you need to decide, am I doing deferral am I, or am I building financial independence? Now, here's what the government has to say about this. Five out of 100 people will be financially secured at retirement age. Okay, that's from the Social Security Administration, five out of 100 people. So the statistics are saying only 5% of us are actually going to make it to financial independence, which means the system isn't working. Okay, it would be one thing if 95 made it and five didn't. It's like, okay, cool. There's room for people that aren't going to work hard. No, no, no. Guys, this is 95% of Americans are going to fail when it comes to financial security at retirement age. It's not going to happen for them. Right, 10 people on this webinar, right? That means that, you know, 5% of them are going to make it, not even one person out of 10. Okay, we add in, we add in, you know, uh, you know, the, the statistics here and we look at what people are doing and it's like, okay, 60% of Americans don't think they're on track for retirement. That means there's 55 that, or there's, there, there's 45, sorry, 35 that think they are and aren't. They're going to have a rude awakening. If 60 already know they don't, it means there's 40 that think they are. And we're saying five total are actually going to make it. That's 35% that think they will be there and they're not going to be there, right? Now, um, a little bit about what we do, and this is going to talk about the partners we work with. So uh, my company, we help uh, families, individuals, entrepreneurs achieve greater financial freedom in life, you know, financially fund a life of abundance and prosperity in all dynamics. The concept we use are, is, is around for a very long time. It's got a very proven track record, Okay. We use a 200-year-old proven concept delivered by the best team in the financial industry. Uh, we work with the Money Multiplier Agency. Um, they work with, you know, with this concept we're going to talk about today called the Sacred Account. Uh, they work with about 900 clients a month. Okay, they're the number one agency across the board in the nation. They've been doing this for a very long time. And so we have a, a very proven concept. We have a very strong team with us. Um, you, you know, we got companies that we'll talk about today that have a one to 200-year track record of financial stability. So this is not a new thing we're talking about. Okay, we're going to talk about something that's been around for a very long time. It actually predates Wall Street and it predates the banking system, right? And, and we'll talk about the companies we work with today. So some of these that we work with, uh, we work with One America, Lafayette Life, Guardian, Penn Mutual, Security Mutual. These are the main companies that we set these, these sacred accounts up with, right? And we'll talk about kind of this, the ideal strategy behind this, right? But before we do, Some of these are, are things that I'm going to cover today. I'm not going to hit all these just for the sake of time, but think about this. And this is really, again, like the financial literacy level of, of knowing that I can learn about money and then also not thinking I know it all, right? So if I'm watching this, one of the questions I've got for you is, do you know the difference between money and currency? Okay. What is the difference between money and currency? Okay, anyone that can answer correctly in the chat, whether you're on Facebook, Instagram, or on Zoom here right now live, if you can answer correctly in the chat, um, I'll give you a free ticket to the Arena Bootcamp on June 3rd. If you can put the right answer in the chat, the difference between money and currency. Okay, I'm going to check our chat here uh, and just give you guys a, a minute or two to answer. Uh, Dan says money has real intrinsic value. Okay, good. So that's correct. Um, so Bree, can you make sure Dan N gets a free uh, ticket to the arena bootcamp?
Awesome. Dan got that right. So money and currency. So currency is a medium of exchange, right? You earn currency and you spend in currency. Money is a store of value. As Dan had said, it has intrinsic value. Intrinsic means it's got worth inside of it, right? So with money, when you hold money over the long haul, it actually holds its value and maintains. With currency, it doesn't. And, and so the US dollar, for example, we all call that money. It's actually currency. It's not money. If you hold US dollars, you will lose value, period. Right. If you use money, right, gold and silver, uh, you know, real assets that store value, real estate, life insurance, you maintain your value. Right. You maintain your value or you you actually outpace inflation and you maintain grow your buying power. Right. You can't do that with currency. Um, now, the other one is what investments actually use compounding interest. This one I won't wait for an answer on. We're all taught about compounding interest. We're told, you know, compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world, according to Albert Einstein. You know, you should invest in retirement accounts because of compounding interest. And the reality is there's only one type of account that truly uses compounding interest. And the reason why there's only one account that truly uses it, even though we hear about it all the time, it's talked about a lot. The reason why there's only one account that truly uses it is as soon as you either lose money, withdraw money, or don't make money, you no longer have compounding interest. Right. If I were to draw this out, you know, just to give you an example, and I'll flip Instagram back around, compounding interest works like a staircase, right? So year one, we have growth. And it levels off and it builds. So if we lose, have a down year, it's no longer building. That's not compounding. As soon as we've lost, we're no longer compounding. Right. Now on the flip side. If we have a year where we make nothing, that's also not compounding, right? It didn't keep growing. The ladder stopped. The stairs quit going up. That's not compounding. So for something to truly be compounding, it means it keeps going up every single year. And you've got principal and interest growing with interest and then principal and interest growing with interest. And it continues doing that all the way up to the top, right? And it never gets interrupted. That's compounding interest, right? And we hear this myth about, invest in retirement accounts and put money in the stock market, earn compounding interest. There's one place you earn compounding interest. Okay, and I'll talk about it a little bit today. Now, the next question, are your dollars worth more in the more today or in the future? Right, so let's say I give you, let's say I give you $10,000 right now, okay? Is that $10,000 gonna be worth more today or is it gonna be worth more in 10 years? Right. And this one might sound easy when you think about it. You're like, oh, well, inflation, it's worth more today. Right. Well, no, 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 no. It depends on what you do with it. Right. So if I give you $10,000 and you just sit on it or you bury it in your backyard or you put it in your bank account, then yeah, in 10 years, it's going to be worth, worth less because of inflation. But if I give you $10,000 and you invest that or you put that in a store of value because of the growth in the future, it's a very high chance that it's going to be worth more then than it is now. Right. And so whether or not money is worth more today in the future all depends on the knowledge and behavior of the person who has the money. OK, uh, another question here, I'm going to flip Instagram back around so you guys can see the charts. Uh, taxes, do you think they're going to go up or down? Right. Whoever can give me in the chat the correct answer and why that's the correct answer is going to get a free boot camp ticket. Right. And, and I can't forget about Facebook here. I want to make sure that Facebook is is engaged in this also. Right. So whoever can give me the correct answer on taxes, are they going to go up or down in the future and give me the reason why in the chat, we'll get a free arena bootcamp ticket. Again, this is going to be on June 3rd, right? So put your answer in the comments or in the chat. Uh, this is for Instagram. This is for Facebook. Uh, you know, this is for uh, Zoom. Doesn't matter, right? Put your answer in the chat. Whoever's got the right answer on that's going to get a free bootcamp ticket on June 3rd. Okay. So taxes, are they going to go up or down? All right, let's see. Let's see what kind of answers we're getting on uh, Zoom here. All right, so far we have Reggie. Taxes will go up because of debt and inflation. That's correct, Reggie. Uh, Ian, taxes will go up relative to inflation. That's correct. Uh, Anna says taxes will go up. Halfway, Anna, you got to tell me why. Why will taxes go up in the future? I'll give Anna a second to get the rest of her answer in here. Uh, because of debt. Okay, those are all very valid answers. So 
you guys, all three, you guys do get a free bootcamp ticket. If Bree, if you could keep track of that, we can get them all uh, their bootcamp tickets set up. So taxes are going to go up. And there's a couple of reasons why. Right now, we're in one of the lowest relative tax climates of all time. The other thing is income tax is mostly used to cover the interest that we owe to the Federal Reserve Bank because the U.S. Treasury borrows money from a private corporation. And the income tax that we pay services the interest on that debt. Therefore, when we borrow more money as a country, that debt and that interest cost goes up and the government doesn't produce any revenue other than through taxation. So the more we borrow, the more we have to pay in taxes, right? And that's just the cycle of that. Like income tax covers debt, right? That's that. So as long as we keep borrowing money, right now there's this whole thing about the debt ceiling. Do we raise the debt ceiling? Do we default? Guys, we're not going to default. They're going to raise the debt ceiling at last minute. They're going to keep you in suspense, da, 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 da. They're going to use it to be a, when I say they, the politicians, they're going to use it as a negotiating point for whatever little bill they're trying to pass or thing they're trying to put in as a writer. Uh, and then they're going to say, cool, let's raise the credit limit and keep charging the card up. We're not the ones paying the bill the American people are anyways. Okay. That's how that works, right? So um, the other one is that what you make or what you keep, and that one we're used to hearing, but the other part of that question is that what you keep or where you keep it, right? The location you keep money is just as important as the fact that you do keep it. Okay, and if we remove money from the equation, a lot of times we, we, we get money involved and we start to get emotionally associated. Let's replace money with ice cream, right? You're planning a party. You need ice cream, okay? So you have ice cream. Great. So is it important that you have it or is it important where you have it? If I tell you you have ice cream in your, your walk-in closet in your bedroom, doesn't matter that you have ice cream. It was the wrong location, right? If you have ice cream in the freezer for the party, it's, the, it's now the right location. You can actually do something with that ice cream when you need it. The same would be true of money, right? Having something and having it in the right location is just as important. Sometimes the wrong location negates having it in the first place. If you keep you know, 100 years ago, if you keep a dollar in US dollar in currency and you left it there, it's only worth about 10 cents today, right? And, and I think it's even less. I think it might be closer to a penny now, but that just goes to show you that because I didn't keep that dollar in the right location, it's not worth even a fraction now. It's very low. And so if I kept it in the right location, that dollar could have turned into more than a dollar because I put it in the right location. Right. And then the final one is what do you actually know about your retirement account? A lot of people put money in retirement. Right. Um, and this one is going to be a wild card. So whoever can accurately guess the annual cost on average of investing with Wall Street. Right. The, this is between fees, cash drag, tax turnover, everything. Whoever can guess this. And even if you saw me talk about it before, whoever can give me the correct number on how much per year it costs you to invest in Wall Street in percentages. What's the annual percent that you're going to pay towards fees and, and expenses and all these different Wall Street ratios? Whoever can give me that number in the chat will get a free ticket to the Arena Bootcamp. Okay, again, this is an annual percentage, and I will give you a hint. It's way higher than anyone says, right? Way higher than anyone says. Let's see what kind of answers we're getting. All right, Dave got it. Dave got it about 5.82%. And that's because Dave just saw that yesterday. Um, so guys, that's true. Most people don't realize that when you invest with Wall Street, it's done in a retirement account between all of the fees that you pay and they're not all disclosed. You've got to dig through the prospectuses to find them. There was a study done by Anderson Business Group. It's an attorney firm out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And they reported that the annual actually adds up to about 5.82% that you pay between fees, costs, you know, cash set asides, reserves, money that doesn't get invested, money that Wall Street holds off to the side. You don't make money on that money, right? Uh, all of those costs add up, right? So that's really what we're looking at as far as financial literacy. Now, here's another one. Okay, this is another one that we cover and it, and it shows the difference in, in how we're marketed to with a financial literacy standpoint, right? So let's say that you have $25,000 in my bank. Let's say that I'm your bank right? You put $25,000 in and you're like, okay, I need to buy a car. Now that the money in the bank account with me, I'm paying you 4% interest on your money in a bank account. And if you go get a loan from my bank, I'm telling you, Hey, I'll loan you $25,000 at 6%. So you could save $25,000 at 4% or you could borrow $25,000 at 6%. 
right? Now, most of us have been conditioned by the banks to look at percentages. And one thing I'll tell you today is that the wealthy don't, don't, don't worry about percentages. They think about dollars. They don't care about the percentage. They look at how many dollars I'm actually making. But the average person doesn't do that. We look at percentages and we're easily manipulated by those percentages. So someone would look at this and say, okay, 25,000, I'm earning 4%, or I could borrow 25,000 at 6%. Well, 6% 6 interest that I pay is worse than earning 4% on my money. Therefore, I'm not going to borrow the 6% money. I'm going to spend my money at 4% that's in savings right now. I'm going to liquidate my savings because I would rather not earn 4%. It's cheaper than to lose 4% than pay 6%. Does that make sense? So most of us were like, okay, cool. 4% is less than six. I'm going to spend the 25K in cash, right? I'm going to flip Instagram around so they can see this. I'm going to spend the 25K in cash because 4% is less than 6%. And I want to avoid paying 6% in interest. What's up, Dustin's in the house. Right now, the mistake here is this. This is, again, where financial literacy is so important. It, I say, I'm not going to borrow the money, right? I'm going to spend the 25,000. Well, 25,000 in debt, 6% for 60 months on a car loan. My monthly payment is 483.32. 483.32 for 60 months means that I will pay 28,999. If I would have borrowed the money at 6% and left my 25,000 in savings at 4%, my savings would have grown to 30,525 and I would have only paid 28,999. Meaning if I would have borrowed the money instead of liquidating my savings, I would have actually made a profit of $1,526. You see, the average person doesn't think about this. We think debt is bad. It's bad to borrow. Cash is good. Let's pay cash for everything. And I just showed you that even though the interest rate is higher on the debt that you're going to pay, you make less money if you would have, if you would have liquidated your cash. Because your money could have kept growing. That's called future value. That's the importance of that compounding interest, right? So this is, again, like a paradigm shift. Now, we're only going to change. We would only change one thing here today. And so I'm going to I'm going to share with you today, like, we're not. Like, I want you to change one thing, and that's the location where you put your money, the location that you put your money in. Now, when you borrowed money from my bank, in this example, I loaned you money at 6%. Okay, I'm paying you money at 4%. Okay, the reason why I have this money to loan to you is because someone else has $25,000 and I'm paying them less than this in interest. So I can borrow against their money and, and charge you this, right? And so we're telling you today, change one thing, which is where you put your money. Don't put it in someone else's bank. And we're going to change one thing and that's just the location. Instead of using a bank, let me just share you, share you this, this small little change. If we use life insurance instead, you're going to see what this looks like. I'm going to show you the difference here. We're going to, we're just going to change. Instead of putting money in bank, we're in the bank. We're going to put it in life insurance, right? We're going to use something called whole life insurance. So whole life insurance, it lasts your whole life. It pays out a tax-free death benefit to whomever you choose. It's got a tax-free savings account. This is over 170 years old. It grows at three to 5% tax-free, guaranteed to grow and guaranteed against loss. It has never lost money and only made money. And they make you an equity partner in the insurance company where you share in the profits. If you deposit your money in a life insurance policy instead of a bank, I'm going to share with you today how it can make you financially independent and give you more financial freedom and actually allow you to become the bank, right? If you're paying attention right now, uh, we have bank failures happening in this country, right? We have Silicon Valley Bank that just went under maybe two months ago. Uh, then that's followed by Signature Bank. Uh, we've got First Republic that went under. We have Credit Suisse that went under. I talked to a new friend of mine in Austria. She said, oh yeah, Deutsche Bank is about to fail as well. It's very hush-hush, but that's about to occur. Guys, banks are not a safe place to put money. And so as we're talking about this today, I want you to realize you're probably putting your money in a bank, right? And the bank is not paying you 4%. In this example, let's some magic fairy tale bank where you're earning 4%. You're probably earning closer to like 0.3, right? Maybe 0.4, not 4, right? So you're, you're getting almost nothing for your money. And if you change one location, one thing in your finances, which is I'm going to put money in the life insurance instead of the bank, the result can be tremendous. Okay. Now the life insurance, I'm going to argue the point here that it's the safest place you can save money. It's guaranteed against loss. Okay. It's guaranteed to grow. Not only is it guaranteed against those things, it's got almost a 200 year of doing so. The money that you put in your life insurance policy is not taxable. 
There's no stock market volatility. You don't have wealth management fees. The money in most states is protected from creditors and lawsuits, and you've got complete privacy over what you do. Okay, that's not the case with the bank. Guaranteed against loss, 90% of the deposits in uh, Silicon Valley Bank were not FDIC insured. Okay, guaranteed to grow. Okay, cool. You can guarantee growth at 0.30%. That's not awesome. Taxable. Your bank interest is taxable. You have stock market volatility. You may not, but the reason SVB went under is because they did. They invested in risky stuff with other people's money, the deposits. They lost that and couldn't pay everyone back. Right? There aren't fees for wealth management, but you will pay account fees. You're not protected from creditors. You're not protected from lawsuits, and everything you do gets shared with the government when you put money in a bank. Right, the life insurance. This is the case here. All of these things I've said are true, and so in my opinion, that is the safest place you can put money. Right now, here's how banking works. Right, this is called the banking quadrant. I wish that I would have learned this earlier in life. I got very close to learning this, and I didn't learn it till years later. Right, so when we put money in a bank, we deposit our income into the bank. Right. And so when I was a kid, I opened up my very first bank account. I went to the credit union with my dad. We opened up an account there. And I literally thought, guys, that they take my money and they, they put it in a little shoebox with a bow on it and they leave it in the vault so that when I come back, my money's there. Not the case. The bank borrows against your deposits. Okay, this is a fact, right? And, and they don't just borrow against your deposits. They borrow most of your deposits. Right now, a bank's reserve ratio, meaning that the money that you've deposited that they keep on hand is between zero and 2%, which means that 98 to 100% of your money is not there. It's being loaned out and invested. So they borrow against your deposits, and then they're going to give that money to a borrower. So that person that's loaning, that's borrowing money for a car or for a mortgage or for a small business or for a student loan or debt consolidation loan, whatever it might be, that was someone else's deposits. The borrower is borrowing someone else's deposits, but instead of borrowing from the depositor, the bank is acting as the middleman. So the bank is taking these deposits here and they're, they're then loaning them out to the borrower and they're charging interest, right? And so the interest that they're charging might be on a mortgage 4%, right? On a car, it might be 8%, but they're charging interest. And so the thing is, is that the depositor is only making on average right now 0.34%. That's how much people make on average with their checking and savings accounts. Or sorry, with their savings accounts, right? So if the bank gets to borrow money at 0.34% and then loan that money out, even on a mortgage really cheap at 4%, look at the profit the bank just made there on none of their own money. They're not risking their money. They're risking your money. Okay, the other thing I didn't know is that banks have shareholders. Shareholders own the bank and they earn dividends on the bank profits. And so when you put money in a bank, very literally, you are a depositor, you're putting your money in, they're paying you little to nothing in interest, they're taking your money and borrowing it, they're taking 98 to 100% of your dollars, loaning them out to other people, charging interest rates that are on the low end, four to eight. On a credit card, they could be charging 19, right? They can also do foreign currency trading and private equity, like they can make all the money they want to make, and then they're going to pay us almost nothing. They're going to keep all the profits and you're going to have your mind blown today when I tell you what they do with the profits. Okay. If you're watching, if you can tell me where banks put the, the majority of their reserves, okay, where are they putting their profits? If you can tell me the correct answer, I'm going to give you a free ticket to the arena bootcamp on June 3rd. Okay. So if you can answer in the chat on Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, on zoom, or if you're watching the replay on, on YouTube as well, uh, or on the podcast, if you can comment the correct answer, when banks make profit, what's the first place they're going to put it? Where do they, what are they the number one owner of? Okay, this is not a super hard answer. And I won't answer the question yet because I want to blow your mind with the answer in a couple more slides because banking works, right? Now, we talked about the car thing. We talked about the car thing. Right. I want to share with you by changing just that one thing, which is the life insurance. Right. And we put the money in the life insurance instead. What if you could become the banker? What if you had your 25,000 growing at 4% and it was going to grow to 30,525? And you could actually, as the banker, loan the money to yourself, 5,000, pay yourself the interest at 6%. 
for 60 months, pay yourself the car payment instead of the bank. And then you would have the future value here as well, while your money still grew. You can make money at 4% while paying yourself 6%. And the difference, the only difference here is the location you put your money. Right, example one on this slide, we talked about you had 25,000 in my bank. And I was going to pay you 4% interest and that's what it would grow to. And you were going to get a loan from my bank and I was going to charge you 6% interest and you were going to make that monthly payment to me. And that would be the total you'd pay over 60 months. If we change just one thing, which is you use the life insurance to become your own bank, you've got 25,000 at 4% growing for 60 months. You're going to have that. You still will get a loan for 25,000. You still will pay yourself 6% interest, 483.32 a month. You still will pay yourself that over the next you know, 60 months. And at the end, you got to have the best of both worlds, right? You become the bank. And I'm going to show you, show you how this works, right? Now, before we do that, let's handle why would we borrow against money? Why would I borrow against my own money? This is a question that comes up. It makes no sense. It's my money. Why would I borrow and pay interest on it? So let me answer a couple of questions for you. First, when we withdraw money, we lose the future growth. So back to this example, I've got 25,000 growing at 4%. If I take the 25,000 out, I'm no longer earning 4%. We can all agree on that, right? So when I withdraw money, I'm losing growth. I'm losing future value, right? Now, the other thing is when we withdraw money, we pay taxes on gains, right? As an investor, there's two things that I want to avoid more than anything else, and that's losing an asset and paying taxes, when I withdraw money, I experience both of those. I lose an asset and I pay taxes, right? And then when we withdraw money, we've traded an asset that gains value for an asset that loses value, aka cash. So let's say that I have my money growing here at 4%. Let's say that this isn't the bank account. Let's say maybe this is gold instead, for example. I own gold and gold grows at 4%, which is kind of a low rate to predict for gold, but let's say that that's what it is. Okay, well, why would I trade gold at 4% gain for cash that loses 9% a year? Makes no sense, right? So I want to avoid withdrawing money, right? By borrowing, our funds keep growing at a rate higher than what we borrow for. We pay no taxes and we keep only for the assets that gain value. That's why we would borrow. And back to this example up here, if we borrowed money, we would have actually only paid $28,999 our money would have still been in savings. We would have grown it to 30,000 and we would have made a, a profit of $1,500 to borrow our own money. Okay, now you can borrow money from someone else's bank and make that payment to them and pay them that, pay them that interest or you can borrow from your own bank. And if you knew how to be your own bank, you could do that. You could take your 25,000 and loan it to yourself, still have it there growing while you use it and make those payments to yourself. Same payments, same dollar amount, same interest, same everything. The difference is it's your bank, not theirs, right? Now let's talk about what happens when you put money in a bank. This is this is reality. And this blew my mind when I first learned. So let's say you deposit $100,000 in your bank account, right? So you put $100,000, pay you 4% interest. Like we said, we've got this magical unicorn fairy tale bank account. So they pay you 4%. Now the bank takes your $100,000 and let's say that they loan it to someone on a mortgage at 7%. Okay, so they're gonna get 7% interest from the guy on the mortgage. They owe you 4%, they get to keep 3%. Now what happens? You, you buy the house, the guy that there, sorry, not you, but the guy with the mortgage, he buys the house. The money from the sale goes to the seller. The person who sold the house gets the money. What is the seller gonna do with that money? He's gonna deposit it in the bank. So now the bank got the money again, right? And then the bank is now going to pay him 4%, okay? The bank's going to take the 100,000 he just deposited. And let's say he loans it out to someone on a car at 8%, okay? So he's earning 8% interest, the banker is. He's paying 4% to the one that's that, that, that deposited the money, the seller. He's making a net profit of 4% again. Now, when the guy goes and uses this loan to go buy the car, the car dealer gets the cash. Where does the car dealer put the money? He puts it back in the bank, Right? So now the car dealer deposited the money. He's being paid 4%. The bank loans it back out again on a home remodel. They charge 9% interest on that loan, right? So what is 9% minus the four they're paying to the car dealer? Five. So the bank's making a 5% profit. Now the home remodel, he gets the money for the home remodel. It goes to a construction team. The construction team does what? They deposit the 100,000 back in the bank. And then the bank takes that money. They pay the construction guy 
4% interest on his deposit. They take this money, they loan it out to someone at 12% for debt consolidation. Okay, debt consolidation, they're paying, they're earning 12% interest. The bank is paying 4% to the construction guy who deposited the money. The bank is making an 8% spread there, right? So when the debt consolidation happens, this loan pays the credit card companies off who then take the money and they put it where? Back in the bank. So here the bank made 3% on the mortgage. They made 4% on the car. They made 5% on the home remodel loan. They made 8% on the debt consolidation loan. The bank made 20% on, on the same $100,000. And they're paying 4%. They're making 500% more money. Right. And this is not just an example. According to a study done by Bauer Financial, it's a third party company that actually studies banks. Banks make between 400 and 1300 percent on the money you leave there. So this cycle, again, of the banking quadrant, you're depositing money in the bank. The bank is borrowing your deposit. They're loaning it out to other people. And then they're making money on the profits. The shareholders are making the profits. They're making not just some interest, right? They're paying you how much? The average savings account right now, the average savings account is 0.34%. And we just realized, we just learned that the bank makes between 400 and 1300% on the money you deposit. So that's their cost. That's their profit. Okay, do you think that they that they have any incentive for you to become the bank? No, right? And, and it makes me wonder, like, how in the world are they going out of business? Like, Silicon Valley Bank, they're making 400 to 1,300% on deposits. How are they going out of business? And the reality is, is the banks can do a lot more than just loan money out, right? They can, they can invest in, in all the loans we talked about. Banks also can invest your, your deposits in the stock market. Okay, they can do foreign currency trading. Right. Uh, they can also, if they wanted to get involved in criminal activity, they could. JP Morgan Bank in 2020 was fined $2 billion for fixing and rigging the silver market. The year before that, there was a tanker that they had financed in Philadelphia, a ship where they found over 20 tons or 20 million tons of cocaine financed by JP Morgan Chase Bank. Right. Like that's the kind of stuff they can do with the money, it's their discretion. But the bottom line is they're making all that and paying us nothing. So what if you could be all four, right? What if we deposit money? And this is what we're going to do with the life insurance. We deposit money in, into our bank. Again, the only thing we change is the location. Okay, we're going to deposit money into our bank. We're then going to borrow against our own deposits. We're going to loan that money to ourselves. We're going to use those for investments and purchases and paying off debt, things of that nature. All the stuff we looked at you do with the usual bank. But when you do this, the life insurance company makes you an owner and you earn dividends on the profits of the system. You can literally do the same exact thing the bank's doing. Like, think about this. This is not a new thing I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you already deposit money in a bank. You already do this. The bank already borrows against your deposits. So someone is already borrowing against your deposits. Then that money gets loaned out to someone to pay off their debt or for them to make a large purchase or for them to invest. That's already happening too. And then dividends are being shared to the profits to the to the and profits to the shareholders. That's already happening with your money as well. So we get rid of the bank and we use a life insurance policy instead. We just change that. You deposit money into it, but you now get to borrow against your own deposit. You have it in the life insurance policy. You can borrow against your deposit. You can loan it out to yourself. You can invest it. You can do large purchases. You can pay off debts. And as that system is profitable, you're a shareholder in the insurance company and they pay you dividends on the insurance company profits. This is how you become your own bank. The way you actually become your own bank is through owning the life insurance policy and practicing the banking concept with it. And this is the only asset class that truly allows you to do this the way that the banks do it, right? Now, I want to show you, so you deposit funds into your account. You have access to 70 to 90% of what you deposit, 70 to 90%, right? Your deposits are going to grow at three to 5% per year on average tax-free. You can borrow against available funds and use them while your money still earns three to 5% like it never left. So you put in money, you can, while it's there growing, you can borrow 70 to 90% of it. 
your money will still still keep growing at three to five percent per year on average you can borrow against it your cost of borrowing if you structure this correctly is only going to be about one to three percent net cost it's meaning you're going to make a profit on your money that you're earning minus the interest you're paying when you borrow your own money you'll use the borrowed funds to pay off debt make large purchases or invest then you'll pay yourself back at your own pace on your own schedule you become the bank Okay, here's what this looks like. Just to give you a written example, you put a dollar into the system like this in year one, your dollar now grows at three to 5% per year, right? That's tax-free. It's also got all the protections we mentioned today. In 10 years, because of this growth rate, your dollar will be worth $1.50 at that three to 5% rate. Now, while it's growing in year one, you can borrow 70 to 90% of it. So we're gonna call that 80 cents off of the dollar. You can borrow 80 cents out, your full dollar still keeps growing. You take this 80 cents and you do smart things with it financially where you earn eight to 12%. You take this eight to 12% and you pay yourself back just like you would with the bank loan, right? Now, the result of this is your dollar is still there growing at three to 5%. You're earning eight to 12%. Let's say you did real estate. You've got this little house here now that's producing eight to 12%. So you've got a real estate asset paying you this and then your dollar is still growing doing this. Now you've got two assets. You've just multiplied your dollar. It's growing in two locations now at the same time. You pay yourself back and in year two, you can do it again and you can secure another one, right? You do another house and then you pay yourself back with that one and you do that again in year three. So if you could do this where every single time you borrowed, you secured an asset that's paying you eight to 12%, you pay yourself back, you borrow it back out again. And all the while, your money's growing at three to 5% per year like it never left. How many times would you want to borrow? My answer would be infinite. I would want to do this over and over and over for the rest of my life, right? And that's why we call this the infinite banking concept, right? The infinite banking concept is exactly this. We put the dollar in, it grows at three to 5% per year. While it's still growing, we borrow against 70 to 90% of it. We pay a one to 3% interest cost. We use that to either pay off debt, self-finance a large purchase or invest for passive income, we take the income we're earning or saving from that transaction. We pay ourselves back and we do it again the next year. We keep doing that over and over and over, right? That is the infinite banking concept. And that's what we use the sacred account for, right? Now, I'm not going to get into the car when we're almost at a time here. Um, this is an example of how you can use this to self-finance a car. Um, but I do want to cover the three rules, right? So with the sacred account for this to work, you do need to number one, pay yourself first, right? A bank does not work if it doesn't have deposits. It's your responsibility to deposit into your bank. Okay, number two, you need to pay yourself back with interest. Just like if you borrow money from a bank, you're going to pay interest. You need to pay interest to yourself. Number three, you need to recycle and recapture your money, right? So what does that mean? It means that we're continuing to put money into this. We're continuing to funnel it back in. We put the deposits in. We put the, the loan repayments back in. And then we borrow and recapture anything we would use a bank for. Debt, investing, getting a car loan, getting a debt consolidation loan, it doesn't matter. Whatever we would use a bank for, you now recycle and recapture it with your own bank, right? And if you can do this with a car, okay, what else can you do it with? You can pay off debt. Okay, we have an example of a client here who pays off uh, quite, amount of, quite a large amount of debt, a total of $478,000 in debt. They were going to be out of debt in 19 years, and they would pay literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest. And instead, using the sacred account, they get out of debt in six years. Six years includes their mortgages, right? And the result of this is, and this is something we do for all of our clients that have debt, the result of this is they have all their debts paid off, right? They're actually now saving $5,770 per month, and they fully funded their own banking system. And the future projection of that value would be instead of owing money and paying interest in the future when all the debts paid off and they, they, they look at the same projections, they would have 749611 Imagine paying off all your debt and having 749 Most of the time, guys, when we pay off our debt, we're broke. We don't have money left. The, the money, it all went to the bank and the debt. That's why the debt's paid off is we use the money for the debt. By using life insurance, it's still there growing and that's what it grows to in the future for this guy. Right. Another one is with investing. This is an example of Ted. Ted deposits $100,000 into his sacred account as a lump sum to invest in real estate. 
Ted then borrows 90,000 out against what he deposited. So he put 100 in, he borrows 90, right? His 100 still is growing. So he takes the 90, he invests it in a private real estate investment that pays him 12% interest for five years. 12% interest on 90,000 pays him $900 a month in income, which he then pays himself back with while his 100,000 keeps growing at three to 5% per year tax free. After five years, his 100,000 has grown to 122,100. While he was using it for real estate, by the way, he's earned 54,000 in income from his real estate investment. And basically his cost of borrowing over the five years was 9,457. Uh, he now has a net profit between the sacred account and the investment of 66,643. Okay. If Ted would have taken a hundred thousand and not used the sacred account and just done cash, his profit would only be 60,000. So because of the life insurance, just that one little change, he has an extra six, almost seven grand available. Right now that's with investing. We didn't even talk today so far about the fact that you get a tax-free death benefit, loans never have to repay, your internal values grow tax-free, policies are exempt from liens, judgments in most states. We didn't really even get into the details of that stuff. That's all icing on the cake, right? Now, look at this. There's really the way that I think about this is anyone in this, this universe, anyone watching this, there's only two things that are going to happen is you're going to live and you're going to die. Right? And right now you're living at some point you'll die. And so you have to look at this and ask, if I live, am I better off with or without this concept? Right. Think about what we just covered today, being able to be your own bank, being able to borrow against your deposits, which, by the way, is going to happen anyway. So I'm not asking, do you want this to happen to your money? I'm asking, do you want to be the one doing it to your money instead of the bank? Do you want to be the one making the profit on your money instead of the bank? If you live, you're better off being in the bank than giving money to a bank. OK, what about if we die? If you die, you get a tax free death benefit, which is more than you actually have in assets. You're better off with this if you die as well. So whether you live or whether you die, this concept is better than what you're doing now, right? And you'd have to be crazy not to do this. Now, I'm going to take it a step further, right? So now that, that you know about this, shouldn't everyone, right? How many people would benefit from this concept? Think about if everyone did this, how many people would benefit from what we just showed you today? Which brings about the question, why don't more people know about it? Right? If this is such a good concept, how come more people don't know about this? How come more people aren't doing this? Right? And I want to just cover this. So number one is millions of Americans do. This is a strategy that's done by the top 1%. Okay, the American population is about 330 million people. The top 1% is 3.3 million. That means there's millions of Americans that do know about this. But I want you to think about this also. When you put money in this concept, banks do not make money when you use this tool. Okay, when you use the sacred account, Wall Street does not make money. When you use the sacred account, you never pay taxes on the money. Again, the IRS doesn't make money. So why would there be incentive financially for you to know about this? Do you really think the banks want you using your bank instead of theirs? Do you really think that Wall Street wants you using a mutual insurance company, which is what we use here, which, by the way, purposefully cuts Wall Street out? Right. There's a reason why these, these insurance companies are mutual, not stock. They treat their policyholders as shareholders. They don't want to do business with Wall Street. Okay, I read a report today by One America, right? One America, and they said they said our loyalties to our policyholders, not to Wall Street. That's why we're mutual. We don't want to be our we don't want our loyalty to be to Wall Street. So Wall Street gets cut out and then the IRS gets cut out. Right. So there's no reason why we would know about this. Now, here's a quote from Warren Buffett. Okay, Warren Buffett says, if poor people would just do what rich people do, they wouldn't be poor anymore. Okay, guys, sometimes the answer to our financial product problems is not complicated. It's look at what successful people are already doing with their money and just copy with copy them. Okay, I was telling my some of my marketing team this, you know, today I was like, guys, we don't need to come up with our marketing. We need to look at the people that we actually want to study. Just do what they do. Like we don't need to, to reinvent the wheel, right? Now, here's the thing. Like we look at this quote, if poor people would just do what rich people do, they wouldn't be poor anymore. Right. I hinted earlier in the presentation, I said, what's the number one place that banks put their profit, right? Banks are the number one owner and purchaser of high cash value life insurance on the planet. High early cash value, dividend paying whole life insurance. These are the top 10 banks. This is JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, US Bank, Capital One Financial, PNC, Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, Toronto Dominion, State Street. 
Here's how much money they have in cash value and life insurance policies as of 2018. This number has increased, by the way. Billions of dollars. They're the number one owner and purchaser of, of dividend paying whole life insurance on the planet. So not only are they practicing the banking concept on your money, they're taking your deposits, borrowing against it, putting your money at risk, making profit, paying you nothing, and then making you know their shareholders money on the system. When they get the profit, they're putting it here. They're putting it to the exact place I showed you today. Again, so I'm not arguing the point today that you need to do anything new with your money. I'm telling you that this already happens to your money. It happens to your money now and you get no benefit. Wouldn't you rather be the one doing it for yourself? Cut out the middleman, cut out the bank and do all the stuff that they're going to do anyways. And you make the profits instead of them, right? Who else has used this? So in the United States right now, over 3000 banks in the U S have over $200 billion collectively in life insurance cash value. They're the number one buyer and owner of this kind of life insurance. Joe Biden owns six of these. JC Penney used this to, to, to fund and expand JC Penney. Walt Disney used this to build uh, Disneyland in LA. Okay, Ray Kroc used this to expand uh, McDonald's. He actually funded the Ronald McDonald campaign with his life insurance policy. Uh, Foster Farms, Stanford University, John Rockefeller, Senator John McCain, the Pampered Chef, Waka Flocka Flame, President uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Sam Walton. These are all just examples of people throughout history who we all know who use this concept, right? Now, the problem in America isn't so much what people don't know. It's what people think they know that just ain't so. This is a quote from Will Rogers, right? So why aren't more people doing this? It goes back to people think they know it already. Because we saw commercials on TV and somebody told us enough time to put money in the bank in the 401k, right? We, 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 we look at this and it's like, it's not about who's doing it. It's about how many. Right, that's, that's the mindset people have. It's not about which ones. We look at, oh, the, the larger number, the majority, they must be right. If more people do it, it must be the right thing. Well, the reality is, why don't more people go to the gym? Why don't more people read books, right? I read a stat today. The average American is going to spend 15 years of their life watching TV. That's what, quote, unquote, most people do. That's the average, right? So it's not about how many, it's about which ones. And I just showed you the ones that are doing this. So if we're looking at these are the people that are using this concept, does it really matter why your brother-in-law at Thanksgiving dinner doesn't know about this concept? Is he on the list? Is he in the 1%? No, right? The banks aren't going to tell you to do it. You're going to ask your financial advisor, who, by the way, works for Wall Street. He doesn't make money for you to do this. You're robbing him when you use this concept. He's not going to tell you to do it. So it's not about how many, it's about which ones. And usually when the majority of people are doing something, it's a bad idea. When most people aren't doing something, usually then it's a good idea, right? And we all have this notion, this concept, we hear about the newest crypto and we're like, oh, it's ground level. It hasn't been adopted yet. That means it must be a good idea because not a lot of people have gotten in yet. But we show you a concept that's 200 years old that most people aren't doing. And why don't we have the same reaction? Right? We're not looking for new and exciting. I want to use proven kind of financial concepts. This has never been unproven. This is something that's been around forever. Right? So why is this better? Here's your options is you can keep putting money in the bank. Right? They're going to pay you minimal interest per year, put your money at risk. You're going to make them wealthy at your expense. You can put money in a retirement account. You're going to get market volatility, loss of access until retirement years. You can't touch it till you're 60, while fees eat away at your account regardless of performance. Or you can put your money in cash where it's going to go down in value year after year. Between what I showed you today, which is better, banks, retirement accounts, cash, or using the sacred account to be your own bank, right? It's kind of a no-brainer, right? So that's what I want to cover with you guys today. And as far as company selection, um, you know, that was kind of the, the, the main thing we discussed early on was the companies. We work with five or six different companies, right? And it's not about what company has the highest dividend rate. It's not about what company, you know, has the coolest looking logo. It really is about what company meets your needs. And so when you work with our team, we actually look at what are you trying to do with your finances? What are you trying to do with your sacred account? What do you want the life insurance policy to accomplish for you? And then we're going to match you up with a company that's appropriate, right? We're going to look at who's actually going to do the best job and we're going to put you with them regardless of who it is. 
right? And so there's five or six companies that are really good at that. That's the five or six companies we work with. They've all got different specializations, different things they're strong at, right? And, and so that's really the focus for us on company selection, right? Now, I want to open this up for some questions. Again, guys, if you're watching this, um, and let me just put my, my Instagram uh, down here. If you're watching this and you would like to set up a sacred account, you're like, hey, this made sense. I want more information. Um, you know, I want to get this set up for my family. I want to use this concept. Um, I want you to reach out to Brianna and Julia in the chat. Okay, Brianna and Julia in the chat. And, and, and with that, basically, they'll schedule an appointment with you. They're going to help answer your questions. Uh, you know, they're going to help get you going with your sacred account. But you've got to set up a call with them first, right? They're not going to be able to read your mind, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up questions really quick. And see what we've got in the chat so far. Good. And we'll have to go kind of quick with questions. We went kind of long with the presentation. I have a podcast to get on in a little bit here. But if you guys have questions that we don't get to answer today, schedule with Brianna, schedule with Julia. All right, questions. Peter asks about New York. So Peter, we have two companies that specialize in New York. Um, so we can set up a policy for you in New York. It's going to be Guardian or Security Mutual. Okay, those are the two that we work with in New York. So um, Peter, reach out to Brianna, reach out to Jules, set up a consultation. Uh, we totally understand the New York problem. So we got set up last year to get everything done in New York to be able to offer this service to New Yorkers. Um, I love the, the state of New York, the city of New York City. Um, so that's something that we definitely want to go over with you. Uh, Instagram says my sound is gone. I try it now, Joel. Um, so we can definitely work in New York City for sure, New York State, wherever you're at. All right, again, guys, reach out to Jules, reach out to uh, Brianna. Yeah, that was my cat that jumped up earlier. He tends to do that. That's that's a cat for you. All right, let me see if there's any other questions. Jason's talking about uh, using this instead of a 401k. Yeah, I mean, that's totally something you can do. I'm not a big fan of the 401k. If you self-direct the 401k, it can be good, but otherwise you're just lining Wall Street's pocket for the next 40 years. Lots of interaction, lots of questions. All right, so if your stock portfolio crashes, it doesn't have compounding interest. You only get compounding interest um, if your your money keeps growing. If it ever stops growing where you withdraw it or you make nothing that year, you lose money, you don't actually have compounding interest. All right, guys. So I do need to jump on this podcast. I think I'm actually a few minutes late. We scheduled it pretty tight. So um, I'm going to have to sign out here today, which I hate to do, but I'm going to leave Bree in charge of the chat. Okay. So Bree and Jules are both hosts. Um, Brie, if either of you guys, or Jules, if either of you guys want to take over as host, turn camera on, go over the chat questions and answer them. You're welcome to. Um, and guys stick around. If you've not scheduled with Brie and Jules do so. Um, and then I've got to get on this podcast here. So thank you all for your time. Um, I'll see you back again next week and, uh, hope you had a great session with us today. Okay, guys, great to see everyone. I'm going back through just to see if there was any missed questions that we didn't get to dig into. Ian, for the dollar failing, I actually have a Charles Schwab uh, article that I could definitely send you that discusses that because of how the dollar is positioned in the world economies right now, even with what's going on with Russia and China, that's still such a small percentage of everything that the dollar is still tied into for deals. 
and processes going on. So it's probably not going to fail for a good amount of time. But yes, if we have any type of new monetary system come into play, it will transfer over just because that's going to be the new currency. They're not going to immediately drop everything. The value of it may change, but we will still have a new currency if that ever were to occur. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions. I've had a couple of texts come through. I haven't had any. Well, I've had Reggie scheduled for a call. So if anyone needs that link again, let me know. I'll go ahead and post it. And Peter, as for the 401k, that is a strategy and I have an article for you. So yes, with the self-directed 401k, you can choose the mutual funds and the allocation. That is the entire purpose of it. So you're going to be saving on that management fee. That's typically 1%. And if we look at the life of a retirement account, that 1% average management fee actually wipes out 20 to 30% of the account. And that's regardless of performance. So we know that we don't want to... <laughs> pay Wall Street any extra fees. So yes, if we do self-directed, the benefit of a self-directed retirement account is that not only could you pick to go towards the same type of investments as before that were being selected for you, but you can also choose to go out of the stock market completely and make your retirement account go towards real estate or towards gold and get passive income streams that way. Jason, for the ambassador thing, that may not be a no-go. We haven't had a chance to go through and chat with you yet. Uh, Jerry and I still need to get with you. And that would, yes, be the process. You would want to go through training and get your license to become an agent. We can roll over any retirement account into a self-directed option. The big thing we'll want to look at is how much is in the retirement account before we attempt to roll it over. Let's see, what else do we have here? All right, answered that one. You're welcome, Peter. <laughs> it's great to see you on here. All right, Ian, will do. Thank you so much. It was great having you here. Thanks for your time. Love seeing you here every week. <laughs> That is correct, Dave, yes. All right, I'm posting my phone number one more time. If you guys need to text or call me as soon as this is done, feel free. Also save this number because I love being able to get in touch right away with any clients to just get your needs handled quickly. And I'm going to post my booking link. That's a good question. I'm not sure if Arizona has any uh, strict requirements like New York life. I love that, Peter. And that's exactly what it is, is that, you know, we're breaking free from a system that's been controlling citizens for over 100 years. And it's not the way things always were. And it's definitely not the way things have to be. Oh. Yeah, if you look right under in the chat, just above where you type, there's an option for the two and then in blue, you can select everyone or select specific people.
Yeah, New York is a lot trickier with their requirements for life insurance. So that's really the only one that I know of off the top of my head that's difficult. But we always we do have all 50 states, Canada and Puerto Rico. So that means that there are options. And that's why we have a good variety of companies that have a good track record of over 100 years. And we'll find one that will work for you. All right, I think we're just, oh. Awesome, Jason, definitely gonna get in touch with you soon. <laughs> uh, glad you figured it out, Peter, good to hear. You're welcome, Anna. Thank you so much for taking the time today. It was great seeing you on. And if anyone needs that extra focus, don't forget we do have our 90 day challenge going on and I'm getting to see Jerry posting a lot about it in the private 90 day challenge group. He's also doing it himself and the 90 day challenge is really about going through and it's going to help you save on your bills. Also work on freeing up your income, if not increasing your income, and just getting into a better financial position because it's 90 days of really putting that foot forward, putting your feet to the fire, and making that effort to make financial education a daily focus. So the first step of that 90-day challenge is to actually take 10 minutes a day of studying finances. And you're also going to be tracking your spending habits. So by the end of that 90 days, you guys are going to be in a much better financial position and definitely just on the front for keeping out for any new opportunities and being more careful for anything that's going to be a money suck. We don't want those. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut it out here. So just putting my phone number up one more time. If you want to get scheduled for your consultation or your coaching call, if you're a current client, reach out to me. Make sure you save this contact information so you can always get in touch with me if you need something. I love that. Let's get you taken care of, Peter. Awesome. All right, guys, thank you so much for taking the time today. Go out there and as the Vulcans say, live long and prosper. I will see you guys next week.